Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled Comprehensive Training for Alternative Fuel Vehicle Deployment for Internal and External Stakeholders. Today's webinar is jointly hosted by Clean Transportation Exposition and our event partner, the National Alternative Fuels Training Consortium. My name is Joe Anadi. I'm a senior associate at Gladstein Neandros and Associates, and it is my pleasure to be moderating the webinar today. Gladstein Neandros and Associates, or GNA, is a clean transportation and energy consulting firm that specializes in market development for low emission and alternative fuel vehicle technologies, infrastructure, and fuels for both on- and off-road applications. We, produ we produce the Advanced Clean Transportation Expo, better known as the ACT Expo, which is the largest clean fleet conference and exposition. It represents all alternative fuels and efficiency technologies for all vehicle weight classes. Uh, I'm proud to have today joining me as Bill Davis. He's the director of the National Alternative Fuels Training Consortium. And the NAFTC is the only nationwide alternative fuel vehicle and advanced technology vehicle training organization in the United States. Bill oversees NAFTC's day-to-day -day operations, and he has been instrumental in the establishment and growth of their new national headquarters and training facility. Additionally, he spearheaded the growth of their national and associate training centers from 18 to its current size of 50. Before we get started, I want, want to run through just a few administrative issues. Uh, first, as we go through today's webinar, please feel free to submit your questions at any time by using the question and answer box located in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, at the end of today's session, we'll answer as many of those questions as possible, and we'll also provide you uh, with our contact information for any follow-up questions you may have. Second, we're going to post a full recording of today's webinar, and it will be available for download uh, on the ACT Expo website. Uh, additionally, we'll email you with the link uh, within just a few days so that you can access that. At the end of the webinar, we kindly ask that you complete a quick 30-second survey as your feedback always helps us deliver the best content. And then lastly, for any technical issues or assistance that you may need during the webinar, please contact Grace Jamison at the information posted there. All right, so with that said, let's go ahead and get today's webinar started. Um, I'm going to next turn the mic over to Bill Davis, who's going to provide insight into how to help impacted stakeholders prepare for new alternative fuel vehicle fleet facilities and deployment projects. This is going to include the training needs for each audience, and these audiences are internal staff, such as fleet managers or technicians and fueling crews, as well as external support stakeholders, such as first responders, uh, recovery and recycling specialists. Bill will also provide insight into alternative, vehicle, alternative fuel vehicle codes and standards and how they're going to affect those, those stakeholders and what to do or not to do uh, when providing training for these stakeholders. Lastly, Bill will provide a very helpful list of available training resources for you to choose from. So, Bill, the floor is yours. Thank you, Joe. I uh, want to start off by saying thank you to GNA and uh, ACT Expo for allowing me to spend some time with you this afternoon and talk about a subject that I've worked on for my entire career, and that's training. Um, the training we're going to talk about today is the training that it takes to make alternative fuel vehicles successful. Um, and we want to talk about all of the audiences, as Joe was saying, both internal audiences to a fleet, uh, to the folks that are purchasing vehicles, uh, and then the external audiences that a lot of times get left in the weeds and uh, have to fend for themselves. And we've done some things to help uh, bring that to a level where um, they, uh, they have something that they can turn to. Uh, these are the fuels that we want to talk about. These are the, what's tabbed alternative fuels by DOE and EPA and all of the federal government. Um, and uh, a couple of the first two uh, we're familiar with uh, extensively, and we want to talk about those as we go through. But we also want to hit a little bit on all of the others because some of these fuels, when you're dealing with the uh, audiences away from the folks that drive the vehicles and work on the vehicles, there are some uh, unique considerations that they need to be aware of and you need to make them aware of when you're using those vehicles and you get them into the play. So we'll go through these, talk a little bit, and then uh, as we get to the end, as Joe was saying, please, if you have questions, 
uh, go ahead and record those uh, so that I can try to help answer some of those uh, and make sure we cover your concerns. First thing we want to do is talk about what is training. And I've had a lot of discussions with a lot of people on this, a lot of arguments, especially being in academia at West Virginia University like I am. Um, we have some, some differences of opinion at a time. Uh, training to me is taking a person, and you can use a dictionary definition, that et cetera, I'm still not sure what that's supposed to be, but taking a person, giving them the work in a uh, controlled environment to bring them up to a standard of proficiency uh, by practice, by instruction, by actually hands-on doing uh, that allows them to safely interact with their environment. And a uh, big, a big thing to do, but something that we need to do, and make sure that we have uh, safe use of alternative fuel and advanced technology vehicles. I keep telling people, all of those fuels you saw earlier, they're not more dangerous than gasoline or diesel fuel. They're just different, and we need to make sure we have training so that people understand those differences and can react to them, can handle them, and can work with them. We have a couple different types of training audiences we want to talk about. The first is the standard vehicle audiences, and we'll get into those, but that's the folks that we normally think of, drivers, technicians. We have first responder audiences. Anytime we start putting the number of vehicles on the road that we are now getting with alternative fuels, some of them are going to get into a situation, okay? And we have to make sure that first responders across the board can recognize the situation when they show up, can recognize the vehicles, can safely deal with the vehicles, and take care of the people that have been involved in the incident or accident. Other automotive audiences, more than just the drivers and the technicians, there's other folks out there, and we'll talk about those as we get into them. And then we have a non-automotive audience that we have to deal with. When we're dealing with bringing alternative uh, and advanced technology vehicles onto the highways, into the communities, there are other people out there that are concerned about those vehicles and that we need to uh, come into play with and into contact with. And if we're going to make them work for us, we need to make sure that we have those folks brought up to speed with education and knowledge and skills that they need. Our standard vehicle audiences, okay, we've seen these signs around. Drivers, you know, we have plenty of training out there for drivers. We've been doing it since we started the Alternative Fuel and Advanced Technology Vehicle uh, Movement. I've been working with it for about 18 years now, um, and uh, we've been developing training for technicians, you know, educating drivers about how to fuel vehicles, what to do with their situations. Um, in that last picture, you see that automotive repair, it's not rocket science. Well, I'm going to say it's not rocket science. But in some cases, it can be a lot more extensive than that. Uh, if you look at the gentleman in the picture and what he's doing now, we no longer have mechanics working on our vehicles. We have technicians working on our vehicles. And we need to make sure we give them the appropriate training to get the things done they need to do. Um, if you look at our training classes and you see three or four people gathered around a computer screen talking about what kind of data they're getting from the vehicle, uh, it's extensive as opposed to uh, the guys back when I was younger uh, listening to a car with a stethoscope trying to figure out where a problem was. Okay, Those type of things aren't happening anymore. We now have the technology. We just make sure need to make sure that the people can use the technology. First responder audiences. We have a number of these, and we've been working with some of them for uh, quite a number of years now, um, almost 10 years in a lot of cases. Uh, um, for some of these audiences. Uh, the first one is firefighters. Okay, We got started with, fire, with first responders with firefighters when we started looking at electric vehicles. When the EVs came onto the scene, especially the first hybrids, there was a lot of questions about safety and security for first responders. And they're normally the first people to show up to the vehicle and have to get into it to get a passenger out. Um, they've got to stabilize it so that they can get a passenger out, especially if there's been significant damage to the vehicle. Um, they have to know how to handle fires with the different types of fuels that are out there. And if they show up at the scene of an uh, incident or accident involving a fuel carrier, 
there's possible hazmat issues, and we've had developed training to take care of those. Uh, how serious was the, the first part of it? When I was talking about the EVs, there was actually a newspaper that will remain nameless that printed an article that got us started on this, that if a hybrid vehicle went into a river and a first responder went in to get people out of the vehicle, they could be electrocuted. Not true, but when it's printed in big headlines on the newspaper, everybody believes it. So that's the reason we had to start trying to develop some things and put some information out there to dispel the fears of our first responders. We have a new audience now with EMT, EMS. Uh, in a lot of cases, especially in rural areas, they may be the first people on the scene, and they have to be able to identify the vehicles, secure the scene so that they can take care of the people that are involved in the vehicles. Um, they have a little bit of different language and a little bit different things, and we have actually developed a specialized uh, EMT, EMS course that's available now. And the next one is our police officers. Uh, especially in rural areas uh, and out on the, uh, the highways, uh, they may be the first people on the scene. Uh, and if they are, they may have to get passengers out because of the situation uh, that has come up. They have to be able to identify the type of vehicle, secure the scene, and get the passengers out of the vehicle. With all fuel vehicles, this may be necessary because of um, say natural gas, a fuel leak in a natural gas uh, situation. Uh, with biofuels, if there is uh, um, potential of a fire uh, risk with them, they've got to get the passengers out. So they need to just have an identification of those so that they can get them out. And with EVs, even more so, because when they show up at the scene of an EV incident, they may not hear a vehicle running, but that EV may be still be running. So we have to make sure they understand these things, how to deal with them, and give them a little bit of training so that they can safely respond to these and take care of the people that are out there driving the vehicles. Other automotive audiences. We just got started on a project to develop training for some specialized automotive audiences, and the first of these is collision repair. Uh, we've developed a number of training courses for technicians, but collision repair shops are different now than they used to be in olden days. Now you have collision repair shops that are not really located with a maintenance shop. Um, they may have a technician or two in there, and those technicians may not even be uh, ASE certified technicians, but they may be working with the uh, collision repair shop. Um, and then you have paint booths in there. They have to be able to know how to handle and not put paint where it doesn't need to go, especially for natural gas vehicles. You don't want to paint a Type 4 or a Type 3 cylinder in a vehicle and then have that uh, lamination start to break apart because of the uh, things they used on it. So you need to bring those folks up to speed. Also, those collision repair shops, in a lot of cases, a vehicle will come into those and will never go to a maintenance shop, a total maintenance shop with trained technicians. And if that's the case, somebody in that shop, in that collision repair shop, needs to be qualified to inspect the vehicle for the potential issues with these vehicles before they go back out on the highway. And I've put up here LA Airport Shuttle Van. One of the things that we're trying to do with all this training is to make sure that everybody stays safe. Occasionally it doesn't happen, and when we do, we have to learn from those. That's one of the reasons we're dealing and putting these curricula together. Uh, in LA a number of years ago, um, one of the shuttle vans at the airport had was involved in the typical accident on the highways today. He had stopped and a vehicle run into the back of his shuttle van and crushed the backside of it in the doors and the bumper and things. It went into a collision repair shop and all of the body parts were fixed and replaced and everything was taken care of and it was repainted and everything was just fine. They called the gentleman to come pick it up and he got the vehicle took it out, first thing he had to do was refuel the vehicle. He got to the fueling station, hooked the uh, fueling apparatus up to the vehicle, fuel started flowing into the tanks. Well, what happened is it was a type four cylinder, um, complete fiber cylinder, and when it was hit in the back end, the cylinder was pushed in 
from the impact of the vehicle that hit it. Nobody noticed it. Nobody saw it. It wasn't inspected like it should have been. When he applied fuel to that cylinder from the inside, that place where it had bowed in now bowed out. And if you're familiar with fiber, once you break that fiber, if you push it the other direction, there's a good chance it's going to let go. And that's exactly what happened. The force of the uh, release of gas caught the gentleman right square in the chest, and he ended up dying from the accident. That's what we want to prevent, and that's what we want to do is make sure we let these folks know these are the vehicles you're going to see, these are the problems you may have with them, these are the things you need to be able to do. Fleet managers. Fleet managers got a heck of a job, uh, especially in this day and age. Uh, they not only have to handle the vehicles and the operators of the vehicles and the technicians, they got to handle the buildings. Uh, they got to make sure that all the training is done. So we want to provide a little bit of training for those folks and make sure that they uh, have lists and things that they can use to make sure that all the folks that come in contact with their vehicles are trained and ready to handle any situations that may come up with the vehicles. Again, if you have questions, make sure you uh, put them down so that I can answer them if I can at the end and help with that. Another audience uh, from the automotive side, towing and roadside repair. Recovery vehicle operators, they're no longer tow truck drivers, they're recovery vehicle operators. When they get to an alternative fuel or an advanced technology vehicle, they need to be able to understand it, identify it, know what issues may come up from it, what the danger from collisions may be. They need to assess the damage to the vehicle, make sure that the, uh, if it's a natural gas or a propane vehicle, that valves are closed appropriately or a hydrogen vehicle. Um, and then uh, make sure that the fuel system is not leaking. Um, it's do a quick inspection of the vehicle before they hook up to it. Um, with EVs, it's even more so because they have to know how to correctly uh, remove that vehicle and get it back to either a shop or wherever it needs to go to. Because most EVs, if you try to pick them up with a standard, what used to be a standard tow truck, and drag it down the road, there's the potential that you could extensively damage that EV um, because of the way the systems are set up. Um, and if you destroy a motor generator in an EV, you're talking four to five thousand dollars minimum to be able to take care of it. So we just need to get information out to them, make them understand, and get them into the uh, into the fold as far as how to handle the vehicles that we want to put on the highways. And here's one that most folks don't think about. Automotive recycling operators, or what we used to call salvage yards or junk yards, recycling yards now may or may not have qualified technicians in the yard. Some of them do have because they do automotive maintenance uh, out of their shops, and they have ASE qualified technicians that are ready to go. Some don't, and it depends on which yard that a vehicle is towed to. What's important is that they get training on how to safely dismantle these vehicles, what the issues are, and all of the stuff that goes along with it. They have to be able to identify them when they come into the yard and know what the issues are, like if it's got a natural gas uh, cylinder in the back of it, how do they go about removing that natural gas from that cylinder and removing that cylinder from the vehicle? The same thing with auto gas, if they have a propane uh, tank in there, or hydrogen, uh, especially in California and certain areas now, uh, when they're putting all of the new fuel cell vehicles on the highway. Um, how to handle the other fuels, the biofuels, uh, and make sure that those are uh, handled correctly and the fuel is disposed of in the proper manner. Um, and then for EVs, how to make sure that all of those electric parts are completely dead before anybody gets into them uh, so that there is no chance that somebody's going to get um, a 400 volt 200 amp shock to themselves. Uh, so identifying the vehicles and then knowing how to safely dismantle them and what to do with them. Uh, you don't want to take these things and just put them into a crusher and start crushing, especially if they have a um, like a natural gas cylinder or a hydrogen cylinder that has fuel in it. Uh, those type of things you definitely want to stay away from. So what we want to do is we want to prevent uh, severe accidents and 
with EV batteries, we want to make sure that they get properly um, recycled in the system uh, and that they know how to go about doing that. Uh, first off, they got to get them out, then they got to recycle them. So there's a number of issues that go into those things. And nobody has really been dealing with them. And we've got a, we're working with DOE right now uh, on a set of curricula to handle both these uh, recovery vehicle operators and recycling operators. Non-automotive audiences, government officials. Let me tell you what, if you're going to bring alternative fuels into an area that hasn't had it before, uh, having them on your side uh, will aid you so much. Uh, they're going to want to make sure that the green area gets into their uh, community. They can help you with incentives. They can help you with public-private partnerships uh, and work with you, especially at the county and state levels. Um, so uh, making sure they understand what's going on will help a fleet uh, business and the fleet manager in trying to do their job. Probably the most important one for us with alternative fuel and advanced technology vehicles is code enforcement officials and authorities having jurisdiction. When we want to upgrade our facilities to handle the alternative fuel or the advanced technology, Having those code officials knowledgeable about what we're trying to do is extremely important to us um, because if they know how those facilities need to be put together, then we have less of a problem about making that happen when we get in to start building those facilities. They can work with us and help us with getting variances if we are necessary for the areas that we're operating in. Um, and just understanding the processes for local government approval, bringing everybody together. Um, at a webinar I did uh, several weeks ago, one of the things I uh, mentioned was go talk to your code enforcement official or your authority having jurisdiction. And if they're not aware of what you're doing and aware of the codes and things that are required for your facility that you want to put together, Get them those codes, you know, explain to them what you're looking at, go through them with them, uh, provide them a little bit of education as you go along. And uh, when you become friends with them, uh, it will make your job so much easier as a fleet manager, as a business owner, to bring these things into play. So you have to educate them a little bit as well as educating your folks. Again, if you have questions, please go ahead and uh, send those in. the general public. Why would we need to educate the general public about what we're doing with alternative fuel and advanced technology vehicles? Well, how do we, how do I go about saying this nicely? Um, if we keep them informed and educated about what we're doing and give them the positive message about what we're going to do, it will keep things away from us uh, that we don't want. And I'll give you a real good example, and I won't mention any names, but it's in my home state of West Virginia. It took us almost two years to be able to get uh, auto gas school buses onto the buy for the state. And it was simply because there was a group of people that were extremely concerned and misinformed that if you put a propane tank in a school bus, what you were doing in effect was putting the po a potential bomb into a school bus in front of a school. And even though we tried to work with them and tried to work with them, we didn't get to them beforehand, and it took us two years to make that occur. So uh, they can, and they went to their uh, House of Delegates members and to their state senators and got it held up for a period of time. So, uh, you know, in getting the... the public behind you and getting the community behind you. The majority of them are going to be there, but we need to make sure that all of them understand the positive impact of what we're doing. All right. That's the technical side of the things that I have available for you. Um, I, uh, I just hit on the high spots uh, with this presentation. Um, and not enough to make you an expert or anything, but where do you get information on the training that's out there and the training that's available. Well, I'm going to put ourselves up as number as one of the people, not number one, but one of them. Uh, we have training that we have developed or are in the process of developing 
on almost all of these audiences. Uh, the second folks that I will throw out there to you is your local Clean Cities coordinator. If you are lucky enough to be in an area with a Clean Cities program, get in touch with that coordinator. And I've listed here um, a website where you can go to the Clean Cities and find out where all those locations are and get the contact information for those coordinators. They have done this time and time and time again. They are a wealth of knowledge for you and will help you in making these things occur. We work with them all the time to do training, to do outreach and education type activities. Um, so uh, they're a huge support. Um, and you can visit our booth. We're going to be at the Act Expo 2016 in Long Beach uh, in May and would love to have you stop by if you're going to be out there um, to take a look at what we have available and to talk with us. Uh, and then I'm also going to uh, throw a uh, plug in for the folks that are sponsoring this. Uh, GNA uh, has done a significant amount of work uh, to help fleets and others get alternative fuel and advanced technology vehicles into their systems and get them working. So uh, if you need to contact somebody and you can't remember, you remember who put this webinar on for you, GNA, contact them. They'll get you to the right people in their organization that can help you out. Um, and uh, they've done some extremely interesting projects uh, and some very significant projects out there on alternative fuel and advanced technology vehicles. So uh, those are uh, things that can help you. Um, I want to take just a little bit to tell you about us. Uh, I haven't done that in the webinars, but I want to do a quick rundown of what we do and um, who we are. Um, we're at West Virginia University, um, and we have training centers all across the uh, United States, uh, from Maine to California and from Washington to Florida. Um, that These are community, technical, four-year colleges that work with automotive programs that uh, work with us in the help in the development of our training, but also in the dissemination of our training. Um, we do training for all of the alt fuels and advanced technology vehicles, and we are basically a fuel neutral organization. We work with uh, other folks out there uh, that are trying to bring these vehicles into play in, uh, um, in anything that we can do to make that happen. Uh, we provide education uh, and training about and promote the use of these vehicles. Um, as I have said in many cases, there's a lot of things we do in this country, and some of the things we need to do them because they're the right thing to do. Alternative fuel and advanced technology vehicles right now are the right thing to do. Okay, we look at the environment, we look at our fuel usage, uh, we look at all the things that are going on in the world. We need to do these things because it's the right thing to do. Why do we train? <laughs> oh, this is a perfect example. I saw this the other day and I realized that you know, it gets a little chuckle. But if we train people, we avoid these type of incidents from happening. And this is a model. Okay, this is not going to hurt anybody. It's not going to cause any significant issues, but it just illustrates what you do if you don't have people that are trained. You tell them to go do something and let them go do it. Whether they got your message or not is a question. If they've been trained, they know what to do, and they go do it correctly as opposed to this. Um, and if people don't think that this type of thing does happen, I've worked on both sides of the world, uh, Southwest, Southeast Asia, Europe, uh, North America, it happens, okay? It happens right here in the United States. I've had it happen with my folks in my own shop because I wasn't smart enough to do the right thing and make sure they were trained in what I wanted them to do. Um, that takes me to the end of what I have. I do have one other comment I want to make. If, you are, if you've convinced yourself what fuel that you want to use, another source, and I didn't put it in here and I should have, another source of information for you are those organizations that are out there that are working to make that type of fuel happen. Um, for example, NGV America for Natural Gas, uh, the Propane Education and Research Council, uh, the Electric Drive Transportation Association, um, the Hydrogen Fuel, uh, what used to be the Hydrogen Fuel Cell Council, but California uh, Fuel Cell Partnership uh, now, and then the biofuels uh, organizations, the uh, National Biodiesel Board, and um, and I'm having uh, the ethanol 
used to be an ethnon coalition, but an ethnon organization. Um, go look at their websites, call them and talk to them. Um, they have lists of folks on there that will provide training for you in all those areas. Uh, make sure you contact them. Okay, that's all I have. Uh, Joe, uh, thank you again for letting me uh, uh, letting me talk this afternoon. Joe? Joe? Sorry about Great. that, Bill. I think uh, I, I had a little mute issue there. Uh, I was no I I'm talking to myself in the corner. <laughs> so thank you again. I appreciate the presentation. And, and, and obviously, thank you to you and your team at the NAFTC uh, for your partnership with the Act Expo. I, you know, you, you raised a great point there with the, with the coalitions and, and who those trade organizations are um, and, and them really being allies in this project and, and, and them bringing all these resources to the table. I just wanted to note that, that many of those groups are going to have representation at the ACT Expo. Um, so if you uh, are looking to get FaceTime, are you looking for further information beyond what Bill presented today, uh, that forum would be an outstanding way uh, to get in front of those folks. So at this time, I just want to transition into uh, the question and answer section of the webinar. So again, thank you guys for all attending and submitting some great questions. Um, our first question it uh, goes to the, to the types of fuels, uh, Bill, that you brought up, uh, you know, looking at hydrogen and natural gas and, and plug-ins and, and hybrid electrics. Are, are there, of those fuels, are there specific types that require any, any more intensive or any additional training as compared to the others? More intensive, yes. Uh, they all require training in some manner and form. Um, natural gas uh, and Auto gas uh, jump to the fore is probably and hydrogen as the ones that need some very extensive training uh, because the fuel flow is different and the fuels are different and how they're stored is different. Uh, not less safe, just different. And uh, training the folks on those is extremely important. We've done a lot of work on that. A lot of folks don't understand that the biofuels uh, also need training. And especially when it comes into the, um, uh, the repair shops for body shops and those type of things, um, the collision repair and those type of things as they get into those because they need to understand that if a vehicle is using E85, for example, uh, and it's an E85 approved vehicle, that the components that need to go back into that vehicle when it gets repaired, if it gets hit in the back end and you have to replace the filler and all those type of things, they need to be E85 components that go back into that vehicle. Same thing if a, few, if a fleet's using biofuel, biodiesel. They need to understand that when they replace certain components, they have to be ones that meet the requirements for the use of that biodiesel. So, uh, yeah, they all need training, some a little bit more than others because the fuels are um, a little bit more intensive uh, as far as what goes into the development of the vehicle itself. Okay. So while you were kind of Going into that, you mentioned, you know, obviously you had the case, the, 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 the case study about the gentleman in, in Southern California, and, and, and you mentioned some of the issues that may happen in, in accidents or, you know, things are damaged. So if, you know, as a fleet manager, so if I own, you know, if I got all these vehicles in my fleet or if it's my own personal vehicle, are, are, when I take it to a shop or when I, when I build in um, into my facility the, the ability to replace or repair these vehicles, are there certain certifications that I need to be looking for that, that in some way signify that, that that shop or that mechanic is capable of working on that type of vehicle? Well, uh, there are several things that you can look for. There's nothing that really uh, stands out. You, you obviously look for a shop that has an ASC technician. Uh, that means they have been, they've received training. Uh, they've been tested for their ability to do the things that they need to do. Uh, you can ask questions is the biggest one. Uh, have you worked on this type of vehicle? Um, do you have somebody that's you know going to be comfortable uh, doing the repairs that are necessary for this type of vehicle? Um, you know, and again, this is where the owners need to make sure they identify people that have the capability of uh, working on the equipment that they're putting in front of them. 
Um, and if not, then getting the training for those folks so they can work on those type of vehicles. Mm -hmm. Okay, those are great points. Those are great points. You, you, we talked a little bit about how to approach the general public. I mean, I, I, you know, we we can sometimes have blinders in these cases that we're we're sort of focused on our vehicles and our own operations, and, and we lose sight. And I was really glad that you brought up that point about the need to at least approach, if not you know, convincingly train the general public on these issues. Other than the West Virginia example regarding the auto gas school buses, what other case studies or best practices? You know, what, what types of things can we use as models to best approach uh, that general public audience? Well, the, the first thing is uh, um, something I never thought I would say back years and years and years ago, but using your local uh, information sources, newspapers, uh, television stations, um, radio stations, we have an outstanding relationship with ours. Um, and the reason is, is we want to make sure that we put the correct information out there and put the fact that what we're doing is important not only to us but to the country and eventually to the world as a whole and uh, most of them are looking for little features about folks that are doing the right things and if you phrase it in the right way when you're talking to them uh, it will they'll come out and they'll do a an interview do a some pictures do a video of your operation and go back and put it on and if you work with them uh, and get them up to speed and help them uh, understand this again educate them uh, about what you're doing and why you're doing it um, they'll put a, a thing out there that will just put an article out there or a news report uh, that will just make you seem like you're glowing uh, we've had mm -hmm. quite a number of them in our uh, local and in national publications about what we're doing because uh, folks Believe it or not, the newspapers do like to print things that are good and going on in our world. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Right, I'm going to flip the, the audience on you now. So we talked about the general public. The, the next question has to go with going up in our own organization. And, and specifically, you mentioned a lot of, uh, of the different types of training and, and the scopes of what those training sessions can include. But how do I approach my own management? How do I communicate the value of this training up the, the chain of command to ultimately get these things financed, right? So I mean, I, you, you got to find where the purse strings are being held. And how do I get funding and communicate the need for that funding for these types of trainings? Well, the, the first thing you have to sit down and think about is what message you want to present to them, okay? What training you're going to want to conduct. And then put that message together um, to provide them a, a sound basis for making a decision. And that sound basis is to make sure that we have people that are trained so that when any type of incident uh, that may occur, they understand how to handle it. Because any business knows that if they have a severe impact incident happens, it's going to cost them. It's going to cost them a lot more than sending a person to two or three days worth of training or scheduling somebody to come in and train the first responders in their uh, community to train the people that they work with. Uh, most businesses don't do their own body and uh, uh, painting type things. They uh, contract it out. Bring them in to with their folks to get the training. And therefore, there are no incidents. You're not going to lose a piece of equipment, and you're not going to have a person the cost on those outweigh far what the cost of training is. Okay, that's helpful. So r related to, to what we discussed about first responders, this next question has to has to go with, with how first responders identify the vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, other than, than the logo, you know, uh, you know, Honda EV, Honda CNG, you know, other, other than that basic uh, information that's sort of on the back of the vehicle, not typically anywhere else, you know, if I'm in a first responder, that logo is not necessarily guaranteed to be visible in, in an incident. So is there, is there any push to, to standardize some sort of uh, insignia or, 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 you know, multiple placed locations that makes it clear, you know, what that type of vehicle is, what the response required is? And I'm, I'm thinking something similar to the lines of the, the cargo flag, you know, that four-colored flag 
on the back mm -hmm. of truck trailers, you know, something along those lines. Is, is there any effort to think about things like that? Uh, there have been discussions. Um, I know that uh, some folks are working on things like that. Um, I know that the uh, National Fire Protection Association has been looking at those type of things along with other code folks in the United States. Uh, one of the things that we have done, we have put together a response guide for first responders that gives them which vehicles are out there, and we're in the process of updating it, uh, but what vehicles are out there, what they look like, what the badging is, uh, how you identify those vehicles, what to look for when you roll up to the scene of, the, uh, of an incident. Um, mm -hmm. But there's nothing right now that uh, is, you know, I mean, as you said, the little diamonds on the back, whether it's a blue diamond or a green diamond for uh, auto gas or for uh, natural gas, uh, the uh, logos that you put on, um, on uh, hybrid vehicles, uh, we also, we talk to first responders when they show up at a vehicle, uh, look for two fuel doors, okay? Huh. That's going to tell you that it's a plug-in electric vehicle in most cases, okay? If you pull up to a, like a, um, a uh, Toyota Prius and you see two fuel doors on that, that tells you that that is a plug-in hybrid vehicle that has a fairly extensive battery on it. Um, so those type of things, are, you know, we're helping them with those and giving them all that type of information. But, you know, like I said, there's nothing in um, in play right now to make that occur. Okay. Okay, so I, I got one more question for you, Bill, and, and, and it's, um, I guess it really goes back to the beginning. If I'm a fleet manager, what's my first step? Is what, you know, is there a, is there a training 101 that I should find first and move forward from there? Um, if you're a fleet manager, the first thing that you need to do is uh, start making sure that you are aware of what all the different all fuels are, what you want to use, and how you can do that uh, is you can contact the local Clean Cities coordinator. Uh, you can contact us, and uh, we have actual awareness courses that go into what all the all fuels are, uh, what the advantages, what the disadvantages. Uh, there are things online. You can go to each one of those fuel uh, uh, organization sites um, and uh, the one, I, the one I missed a while ago, and uh, they'll crucify me for this, but it was my fault, is the American Coalition for Ethanol and ethanol.org. Mm -hmm. Those guys uh, have a lot of good information on their site along with PERC, NGV America, EDTA, uh, National Biodiesel Board, and the uh, California Fuel Cell Partnership. Uh, there's a lot of good information out there to figure out what you want to use and which fuel you want to use, and that's your start. That gets you started. Then the next thing you do is probably get yourself in a course about that fuel. If you're a technical guy that's moved up to fleet manager, take a technician course on that fuel. Um, if, uh, if you're not a technical guy, uh, find somebody that's doing an education piece on that particular fuel in your area. And like I said, the Clean Cities Coalitions, I cannot uh, spout their uh, benefit enough. Uh, they have done so much to advance alternative fuels and advanced technology vehicles in our country and to help out with that program. So there's a lot of folks out there that are working it. You're not by yourself. You don't have to be by yourself. Uh, ask for help. That, and that's the big one. Ask for help. You start asking questions and asking people that I need this information. They'll get you to the right folks eventually. That's great. That, that is a really good point. I, I think we're going we're gonna to wrap it up on that one because we're just about out of time today. Uh, so I apologize if, if we didn't get to any further questions. Um, so, and, and I want to I really thank you, Bill, and, and, and your NAFCC team for, for devoting your time to the ACT Expo webinar series today. Uh, so feel free to contact Bill or myself if, if we didn't get to your question or if you have you know, follow-up questions that, 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 that strike you from the blue. Uh, Bill's email is bill.davis at mail.wvu.edu, and my email is joe.anotti, A-N-N-O-T-T-I, at gladstein.org. So we encourage you to continue your education uh, by joining us at ACT Expo less than, uh, less than a month away. It's May 2nd through 5th uh, in Long Beach, California. We have recently posted the agenda. It's really, really strong and actually announced our keynote uh, speakers and all of our panelists today as well. Uh, some great, great representation across uh, several different industries. 
so as you can see on the screen today, uh, we're offering all of our participants in today's webinar a $50 uh, conference registration discount code. Uh, so when you do register, please use the code WEBINAR50. So as a reminder, we will be emailing you out uh, within the next couple of days uh, a link to the recording of this webinar. And, uh, and again, thank you all for joining us today. It's a pleasure having you, and we can't wait to meet you all in Long Beach in a couple weeks. Thanks. Thank you, folks, and I want to say thank you to GNA and to the ACT Expo team and to you, Joe, for, uh, for helping us out and uh, for putting these on for us. It's really going to help uh, as we go forward with alternative fuel and advanced technology vehicles in the United States. My pleasure, Bill.